All right, so let's continue and delve a bit deeper into vector math. One of the really important things that you're going to need to figure out is the vector length, right? It, it's very useful on its own, but it's also really crucial to be used in other vector operations. So let's say that we want to figure out the length of this vector C. Now, it's made up of components A and B, and how can we figure this out? Well, if we take a look at it, what if we move B over there? Does this remind you of anything? Well, if you remember back into math, math class in school, basically what we have now is a right-sided triangle. And it's 90 degrees in between these. These are perpendicular. Now, that basically means that we can use Pythagoras' theorem. If you don't remember what Pythagoras' theorem was, it basically says that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So, basically, if we calculate this, we will figure out the length of c. Now, to get the actual length of c, what we'd have to do is do the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now, just to be clear, a squared basically means a times a, and so it's just times by itself. So what we really need to do here is square root of a times a plus b times b. And if we do that, we will figure out the length of c. Now, thankfully, Maya has a node to do this for us as well. Uh, you can use the distance between node in Maya, which allows you to just connect in two points and it will figure out the vector between them and basically um, calculate the length for you. So that's a lot easier than sitting down and doing it by yourself. Now let's continue a bit with this vector that we have here. And let's talk about vector normalization. Now, vector normalization is basically the operation to scale a vector so that its length or its magnitude is 1. So what we need to do is we basically need to scale the different components so that we figure out the, the length of, so that we get the vector C has a length of 1. Now, as soon as you have a vector that is of length 1, it's often called a unit vector as well. I just want to mention that uh, if you look around the web for more um, kind of learning material on this, and if you come across the uh, like the words unit vector, it usually means a vector that has a length of 1. Now, this is what it will look like if we normalize this vector. So before, it was basically this long, but if we normalize it so that its length is 1, we end up with this. So it still has the same direction, but we just scaled, it, um, scaled its length down to 1. Now, to calculate this, we basically have to figure out the length of the vector, and then we divide each of the components by that length. Thankfully, again, Maya has a very handy node to do all this for us. Um, it's called the vector product node. And you just have to set the operation to none, and then it has an option to normalize the output. So that is very, very handy. Now, the dot product is a funny one, uh, because the dot product will return a number that will indicate direction. So you get the dot product by comparing two vectors. So basically it will tell you the direction between the two vectors like the relationship. So if the the number that is returned is positive, let's say it's like 1.2 or 5 or 13, you know, 187, that means that they're going sort of in like the same direction. But if it's a negative number, it means that they're going in the opposite direction. If the number is zero, it basically means that they are perpendicular to each other. This is quite useful for, and it's it's used a ton in computer graphics, especially when it comes to things like rendering, because what you can do is you can figure out which side of a face you're on by comparing the surface normal to, you know, a, a vector coming from the camera. So you can see if, 
let's say that and this is like a if if you figure out that your camera vector and the surface normal if they're going the same direction you're basically looking at the back side of a face if the surface normal is looking towards the camera you're looking at the front side of it to figure out this you basically have to take each of the components multiply them together and add it all up and again the handy vector product node can do all of this for us so the only thing you have to do is connect up the vectors to the vector product node and set the operation to dot product now let's dive a bit more deeper into the dot product just to try and figure out really what's happening here so you can think of the dot product as projecting the second vector onto the first one so in this case these gifs that you see here the first vector so B is the red vector so what we're saying here is a dot uh, sorry the the red vector uh, dot the green vector now if you look at these if you see here basically this is giving us a positive value so this is you can think of this as just going backwards and forwards on the on the plane on this flat plane so you can see when they're in the same direction they're basically going it's giving us a positive number when they're going in the opposite direction it will give us a negative number you can think of the this the first vector if you had a flashlight that was the kind of like perpendicular to it that was lighting straight down onto this vector the shadow of the of the second vector is basically what we're figuring out with the dark product so you can see that here as well when this goes up and down we will we'll keep continuing to travel along this um the vector here so this is can also be used to help us find the actual the closest point on the first has <laughs> written curve but the first vector right so if you have a line or a vector or a line segment you can figure out th any like any point in space you can figure out the closest point to it um so for this just to kind of give you like a, a, an idea of what's going on here because this n number that comes out here isn't the pure dot product value. This is actually finding the closest point on this vector here. Now to do that, basically what I've had to do is I have to get the unit vector of the first curve. I have to get the dot product from that unit vector and the second curve. And that dot product, that number, that singular number that I get back is the scale value for the unit vector that will basically give me this point here. So if you end up um, taking the unit vector, so in, in this case, the unit vector would be going over here. In this case, the unit vector is here. So when you're scaling that as you're going to go up here, so you can see the closer these get, the the closer the, the dot product will scale up that unit curve as well to, sorry, the unit vector to hit that same spot. Now, I think this scaling understanding is really key to understanding the dot product, right? Because if you think that to be able to match these ideas, if you scale positively, they're going in the same direction, right? But if it's a negative value, we need to scale backwards on the curve. Positive, we scale along the curve. Negative, we scale backwards. And if it's zero, we just remove all length. Then they're perfectly perpendicular, like the shadow is falling straight down. The shadow doesn't have any length. This is a bit of a tricky one, but I hope some of this kind of made sense. So <laughs> let's move on to another tricky one the cross product so the cross product will give you the perpendicular vector of two other vectors so think of this as you have two vectors and you have a plane that goes through both of the vectors the normal of that plane 
is the cross product. So with the dot product, you will get a singular value, but with the cross product, you will actually get a vector uh, returned. And it's really important to realize that it's not normalized by default as well if you try to use it. The interesting thing about this is that it can actually be used to create an aim matrix. Like you have um, an aim node in Maya, right? You need a target and an up target. That's basically two vectors. So as long as you have that, you can create an aim matrix from that. And it's not something that we'll um, go into just now with the uh, vectors, but um, hopefully when we come to the matrix math, this will make a bit more sense. So this is just a visual representation of what's happening here, right? So this is what I was talking about with the uh, having the two vectors. And then imagine there's a plane that goes through those. No matter where these vectors move, the plane will always go through them. Now, from that plane, imagine that we just project off um, on this other vector, right? It's the, basically the surface normal of this plane, you can think of it, right? It's going in that direction. Now, if we remove that, you can see that we have this vector that goes in and out. Now, notice that it's actually it's not fixed length. Like I said, it's not normalized by default. So depending on the direction and the angle between the two vectors, the scale of that perpendicular vector will change. And let's look a tiny bit at why that is. Because you can see here, as we're now basically going through, when they're right on top of each other, the scale of that is zero. When they're perpendicular, then it's fully at one, and then anything in between is basically, um, basically like an interpolation value of that. Now, note also that as soon as you go um, around the 180 rule, or basically like 180 degrees here, then it will flip to the other direction. We'll look at a bit about what that is in the next one, but the order matters here. So this left one shows um, x, like the, the red x, crossed by y. While the left one, sorry, the right one, shows y crossed with x. So note that when this red x is pointing down here, right, it comes down, down here, we will have the blue pointing forwards. While in this one, when the red is pointing over here, the blue is pointing backwards. So it's really important to kind of have an, just a, a bit of an understanding of that. And yeah, like I mentioned, the cross product will flip when we go past 180 degrees because it needs to change the direction because of that, right? Now, how do you know which direction it's going to go in? Well, this is how. Cool. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> you know, so... The direction of the cross product is decided by the right-hand rule. Um, the right-hand rule is basically a, a coordinate system interpretation. Now, Maya uses right-hand coordinate system, and there's also the left-hand, but you know we're not going to go into that. We're going to be focusing on what Maya uses. Now, to do this, um, we will basically have to represent the different axes by these fingers. So the index finger will point in the direction of the first vector, while our middle finger right, will point in the direction of the second vector. Then, as soon as you, you kind of move your hand to make sure that they're pointing in the right directions, your thumb, as long as you keep this kind of shape, right, don't move your fingers around, keep that shape, but just rotate your hand, your thumb will then point in the direction of the cross product. Now, this is why the cross product will flip after 180 degrees. It's because of this, right? Because if we're rotating around, to be able to kind of, you know, keep that relationship between them, the cross product will have to point in the other direction, right? So I just want to make sure that, um, just to clarify, 
I've just color coded these to indicate the current one. So the, like this isn't to say that the um, middle finger will always represent Y or the, uh, like the index will always represent red. Actually, you can see here, I've used different colors for them. This is more to represent the what we had previously, right? We had Y going up and we had X going out here. So X was the first axis, sorry, the first vector that we were using with the Y being the second one. So when I align my index finger along the X axis and the middle finger along the Y axis, it tells me that the cross product will go this way along my th thumb. And that's basically, if you think of with the X pointing down here, as it comes around here, boop, then that will show us that the the Z will basically be facing forwards. So this is something that you can find up online. It's used a lot in maths and in physics as well. So I'm, I'm not alone and I'm not crazy for talking about this. So it's definitely something that you will find other places as well. I, I hope you kind of understand this one as well because it's I think it's a bit of key to uh, figure out to deal with it as well and just kind of understand it a bit better. Now just a final to calculate the dot products what you have to do is to figure out x in a, in a three-dimensional vectors you basically have to take y and z from the from the two other ones so a y times b z negative a said, right, so we're flipping this around now. So basically we're taking all of the the Y and Z here and multiplying them, negating them, doing the same for Y, right? We now have A said, BX, AX, B said, doing that. And basically the result of these will be your cross product. Now thankfully we don't have to do that because we have our trusty vector product node. As soon as we, we can just use this with the operation set to cross product and it will return us what we need. And the glorious thing about this is, as we talked about previously, we can set this to normalize as well. So if we use this with normalized, we will get a nice normalized vector coming out of this.